Not too long ago, one of my patrons on Patreon, Ted Harrington, sent me a package of DVDs. I listed off those DVDs on this channel and then let you vote on which one I should watch. Brave Little Toaster has it, so let's dig into it. Welcome to Durbania, I'm Durbin, and this is my spoiler talk for The Brave Little Toaster. Do I need to say spoiler talk? Are we really concerned about spoilers with The Brave Little Toaster? Well, either way, spoilers ahead. So thank you to Ted Harrington for sending these movies to me. I was super excited to watch them. I also did watch The Gift of Winter because in the voting of which one I should review, Gift of Winter was like right there. And it was right there, I'm sure it's because of my reaction. This is two hours and 54 minutes, Ted? What is this? Two hours and 54 minutes of this? I thought it said two hours and 54 minutes on the back. I'm guessing that's just a runtime of all the cartoons on the disc because I decided to watch The Gift of Winter. It's like half an hour. It's strange, but it's like half hour. I'll probably talk a little bit about that at the end. But anyway, diving right into The Brave Little Toaster. I remember being a kid and absolutely loving the Brave Little Toaster. It was a great movie. I used, it's one of those movies I used to watch all the time. I didn't realize how much I watched it till some of the songs and musical numbers that are in this, they were always like this faint echo in the back of my head and I never knew where it came from. Some of the creepy songs in this were a creepy echo in the back of my head and then I'm watching this, I'm like, oh my gosh. This is weird. It's much worse than I feared. I'll close my eyes and make it disappear. That is where that has come from. Oh my gosh. So it was kind of cool as an adult to go back and see where some of those weird things in my head came from that it's like, where, where would I have ever picked that up? Oh, from some of the creepy scenes in Brave Little Toaster. And yeah, there were actually a few kind of creepy scenes in the Brave Little Toaster. When, but the other thing when I was a kid, I always attached to Lampy because yeah, in this type of group where you have these household appliances and they're trying to leave their house and go through the wilderness, make their way to the city and find their owner or their master as they called it. You know, you gotta have that one leader, that leader that doesn't really have too much of a sense of humor, that leader that's all serious, and that leader that casts the vision and pulls everybody together. Yeah, you gotta have that character. Which is why characters like Lampy I always related to because they were the comedic relief. And so I always had fun with those characters. Same as an adult. When I was watching this back as an adult, you know, I liked the vacuum more as a grown up. I mean, he's just so sarcastic and. I'm not talking to you. He's really more positive than he lets on, but he's embarrassed by how positive he is. So he puts on this front of negativity and sarcasm and grudge. I don't know, something about that character that I actually really liked. But still, Lampy was the character that I really bonded with as an adult watching this movie again. For the same reason, he's the fun guy, he's the comedic relief guy. But then another reason that when I was a kid freaked me out as an adult, I thought, well, that's awesome. There's this scene where there's this thunderstorm and and they're, and Blanky, who's like this like the child of the group, gets blown away by the wind and they can't find him in amongst the trees and the woods. And so Lampy thinks, oh my gosh, I can't turn on my light because because the battery's dead. Okay, I'm gonna plug into the battery, I'm gonna stick my nose to the sky, attract the lightning so the lightning will charge the battery, and it's like a self-sacrifice to charge the battery. So, I mean, even if the light won't work because, you know, it's bursted by lightning, at least the vacuum cleaner can work and pull them along to find the blanket. It was like this epic moment of sacrifice done by the comedic character, and I thought, wow, that was awesome. I also attached to uh, the talking radio in this one, who was actually voiced by John Lovitz. Actually, it concludes all future broadcasting of any sort. We'll sign off now with a suitable tune. I didn't realize that. I also looked on IMDb, and Phil Hartman does the voice of the air conditioner in the wall that shorts himself out at the beginning because he gets so dang mad. I'm not an invalid. I was designed to stick in a wall. I like being stuck in this stupid wall. I but if the kid was too short to reach my dials, we didn't mean it, really. So I thought that was really interesting. None of the other cast stood out to me, but like those were the two big names that I noticed attached to this movie, and I thought, wow. Right on. That's pretty cool. This movie did, as an adult for me though, raise a ton of questions. So in this universe, we have appliances that come to life. The appliances that come to life are lamps and radios and vacuum cleaners and toasters and air conditioners and blankets and so on and so forth. Apparently things that don't come to life are couches and houses and 
the individual floorboards and the floor of the houses and nails. Oh, the chair that they wrote on that the vacuum drugged them across the meadow through that, you know, they were riding on the chair as the vacuum was pulling them kind of like a horse in a carriage. Yeah, the chair doesn't come to life. The individual wheels on the vacuum. I mean, if we live in a world where appliances and objects come to life when humans aren't around, who set forth the rules of which things are always in inanimate objects and which things are endowed with sentient life? I'm just beyond curious. I'm also curious about the rules as to why do these appliances have to pretend to not have sentient life? It's interesting because I was watching this and I was thinking of Toy Story. It's like Toy Story took this concept and made it awesome. And it's not that Brave Little Toaster is bad. Brave Little Toaster is good. But what I'm saying is it's like this concept that Toy Story has has been around. And it was there in 1987 with the Brave Little Toaster. And I saw it some other weird puppet Muppet Christmas special thing. Point is, is the Brave Little Toaster had this concept back in 87 before we get to Toy Story. And so I just thought, what, what are the rules? Why do some things get endowed with life and other things don't? And so I'm just, there's so many things that I'm curious about in this universe. I was also curious, like, is the message this movie's trying to send to small children is be a hoarder because all your appliances come to life when you're not around and you have a bond with them, even if you don't know it. So by throwing them away, you're throwing away their life and their souls and you're showing how much you hate them. Is that a lesson we want our kids to learn? My grandmother was a hoarder. No. We don't want our kids to learn that lesson. Okay, but those big, deep philosophical questions aside, it actually is a really fun movie. And it's kind of interesting to me because they were living in this cabin. So apparently this cabin was the summer cabin of the human family. And they considered their master the little boy. And so this little boy would turn on Lampy and read at night by Lampy's light. And Lampy would read with him. The boy would listen to the radio. The boy would make faces at the toaster. And somehow the toaster was his favorite appliance. Well, it does make food. I guess I get that. And so, like, they all bonded with this kid, but they call him the master. So it ends up having this weird religious tone to it. He's not coming back, pure and simple. We're not going to give up hope. It's like the feeling I get when I think about the master. It's the master! So they would come every summer, and then eventually the family doesn't return. But all the household appliances, they sit there and they eagerly await the next coming of their master. And they continue to hold to the faith that he's coming. They even keep certain duties up around the house and clean the house. This made me wish appliances really did come to life and we really could bond with them because I hate cleaning. It would be awesome to have appliances clean my house for me. Come on, science. Let's endow our appliances with sentient life so that they can clean our homes. Anyway, they kept this cabin clean and they were just expectant for the master. And when the master didn't return, they went seeking the master. This whole movie is their quest for the master. Upon their quest for the master, the brave little toaster even gets convicted in his little heart. He or she? I don't know. But the brave little toaster gets convicted in its little toaster heart that it's being mean to Blanky. Like everybody's mean to Blanky because Blanky's like the child. So everybody makes fun of Blanky, picks on Blanky and bullies Blanky. And then all of a sudden, halfway through this quest, the toaster is just getting this conviction. And they all begin to get this conviction. So it's kind of interesting, this, this religious tone that I think is totally unintentional and only people like me pick up on it, that, you know, is there of these characters waiting for their master. Okay, we're going to go find the master. We're going to seek the master. That said, I thought it was a pretty good movie. Watching it back as an adult, I'd probably give it a C plus. I mean, it truly is a movie that's just kind of right smack dab in the middle. It's not fantastic. It's not breaking new ground. I don't even think it was breaking new ground for 1987. It was just a fun movie about household objects that come to life when humans aren't around. So, I don't know. There was nothing, like, beyond special about it. I haven't seen the sequels. I can't believe it spawned sequels. As a kid, I couldn't believe it spawned sequels, so I'm sticking with my C plus for it. I have fun with it. If you haven't seen it, I could recommend you watching it. I have the links for it in my Amazon Associates links down below in my description. I also did watch The, uh, the Gift of Winter. That was okay. I don't know what to say about that one. That's why I saved it for the end. I wouldn't recommend it, but having watched it, I found myself slightly interested. I don't even know what more to say to you. I mean, it's a 1970s cartoon about a town that was sick of winter in a pre-snow world. They go to lodge a complaint against winter and then winter's hearts gets melted by the love of these children and thus he creates snow. 
There it is. Sorry for the spoilers. Anyway, what did you think of this? Be sure to let me know in the comments. Have you seen The Brave Little Toaster? What did you think of this movie? And while you're there, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell next to that subscribe button. That way you're notified the moment I drop new videos. Thank you, Ted Harrington, for sending me these movies. Thank you for being a Patreon supporter. If you would like to support me on Patreon and check out the different rewards I have for different levels of giving, check that out. I would definitely appreciate your support. I have the link to that in my description. I'm Durbin. Thanks for checking out Durbin. Yeah.